everyone, today's Real Vision Daily Briefing is sponsored by Crane Shares. Learn more about their KRBN ETF at craneshares.com forward slash KRBN. Hi, I'm Rao Pal, co-founder and CEO of Real Vision. As you know, things out there are not okay. Things are really screwed up, in fact. Banks are collapsing around us. The AI nuclear bomb has turned up. We need to figure out what the hell that means for us, for our businesses, for humanity. We've also got a looming real estate catastrophe in commercial real estate. It's chaos out there. And frankly, it's probably not going to get better anytime soon. But one thing I'm passionate about and we're passionate about in Real Vision is in times like this, one thing you need is the tools to learn how to kind of unfuck yourself. And I think it's a really important process You see, in the past, we've had something called the Festival of Learning, which was an amazing event, a a live event where you get to learn and ask questions and be part of a learning community. And we're going to relaunch that on March the 30th and 31st. It'll give you a bit of a break from the daily chaos. Normally, this costs, I don't know, $399, but it's too important right now. It's really important to me personally that you get the tools that you need to navigate these times and to kind of unfuck your future. We can offer this completely free. No credit card, no nothing. Pop in your email, so realvision.com, festival of learning, and just register. Come along, join us. They'll be available afterwards as well, but you need to sign up to get it. So you can really immerse, but you can also ask people specific questions. It's really there to help you. It's free and it literally could change your life. When's the next shoe going to drop? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Paul Hodges, the chairman of New Normal Consulting. Hi, Paul. It's great to see you again. Yeah, it is. Thanks, Maggie. So it, we, it, we're you're joining us at interesting. We're living in interesting times, right? That old cliche really feels appropriate at the moment. Um, I was looking at where we were settling because we were sort of, you know, bouncing around a bit today in the U.S. session, and I was really struck because. Um, on a website, I won't say which one, there is uh, two, there two very different headlines. If you hit bond prices, you get treasury yield slip as banking system concerns grow. And then if you flip and look at equities, it says uh, Dow rises as traders shake off banking fears. I mean, both of those things can't be right. What is your sense of what's going on? I, well, I, I, I look at it, um, you know, last time we talked, uh, we spent a bit of time talking about will markets get back to doing their real job of price discovery? Mm. And and I think what you've just uh, picked up there is tentative steps by markets to uh, try and work out what, what, what they should be doing. I mean, you, you'll have seen that, uh, that piece of the Wall Street Journal this week that said uh, we're now back with, with Amazon, sorry, with Apple and Microsoft at 13.4% of the S&P, mm. and it's the first time since the 1970s that two companies have been that dominant. Then it was IBM and AT&T. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we've quite changed from the fangs, but the, the issue that you've just picked up there is investors are still not really thinking about what are the earnings for these companies? How does that, how, when you look at a bond, when you look at the bond prices, We've got to think about, and you would have thought after Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic and Signature and so on, you would have thought that people were starting to think about return of capital. Mm. And, and that seems to me that the bond market is starting to think about that now, but the equity market hasn't got there yet, which is not so surprised. Usually bonds are lead and the equities follow. So, you know, let, let's say we've got halfway since August. On where we need to go. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, so, you know, w- w- when you look at the banking sector, do you feel like that this is going to just continue to unravel? What yeah. do you What do you see happening? Well, I mean, we if you go back to no, no, no two two thousand and two or two thousand and the dot-com crisis, you know, that was because, and you can argue that maybe it was it was right, you know, uh, Alan Greenspan saw Y2K coming up. There were all these worries that, you know, sort of computers might crash, airlines might, aircraft might fall out of the sky uh, because they couldn't move over the year on the date. You know, they'd only put in two numbers for the date, 
we have in 66, 67, 88, 89, 99. Oh, and you know, yeah, actually it was also, but he, he, he put in a vast amount of, of money just in case the ATMs didn't work on January the 1st. And, and, you know, you, you can argue, as I say, you can argue a bit about that, but it was prudent perhaps. But it caused this fantastic blow off rally in the dot com market, after which, you know, it peaked in, in, in March 2000, and after that, the, the shares fell 80%. So you kind of sort of think to yourself, if, or well, I would if I was a central banker, I'd, you know, I understand why I did that, but it was pretty painful in the end and it wasn't really necessary. So I shouldn't do that again. But of course, they then did it immediately again with, with subprime and the auto loans, particularly the housing loans. And so we get to 2008 and the great financial crisis. And you think, well, that's it. Now they really, they really are going to, you know, to stop this. But no, no apparently the reason that it crashed was because we didn't do enough stimulus. So now we've done another eight trillion, and overall the world we've done you know, seventy trillion, which is you know almost the same as uh, as, uh, as GDP. And, and so you've got all, all these banks who are stuffed with loans, but they can't re- earn any money with it. Mm. And you know, if you look at, you know, it's, very, it's very interesting, if you look at, at Silicon Valley Bank, what happened? I don't think there's, you know, from what we've seen so far, I don't think there's a lot of fraud involved. It's just plain, utter stupidity. But you, 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 you lend to people, and okay, you're lending at the prevailing rates and so on, and then it seems that rates start to go up. So instead of you saying, ah, I think we better change our policy, you say, oh, let's do some more of this. And short term, you make a bit extra money. And then longer term, you go bust. Mm. And, and so, so what this says to me, and this is, this is really the risk, is that you've got a generation of people who still don't understand the role of price discovery. They're doing what everybody else does. I've been on Reddit. Everybody's doing this. It's going to be great. So you think it sounds like it's 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 sort of risk management issues. Hmm. But what if what do you make of Ralph's been talking a lot about the fact that, you know, the basic you're going to have to as long as deposits are paying half a percent, a percent, whatever they're paying right now. And you have people who can get their, you know, the rate on a, a T-bill or, you know, much higher than that. You're going to have to deposit flight now with these uncertainties. And there's nothing that will stop that unless the Fed cuts rates. So there's I, I, something more systemic. It's not one bank's risk management. There's this, the, the, the system is broken, basically. Yeah. And the Fed uh, broke it because yeah, that's what they were going to uh, do well, when they the, raised the, rates. The Fed, the Fed, I think we, you know, I think when historians come to, to look at this uh, with the benefit of hindsight, they'll say it was really Ben Bernanke that broke it. Mm. Uh, that it was Bernanke who came up with this crackpot theory that the Great Crash was not to do with speculation, wild speculation, as you know, the Great Crash Galbraith had written in the Great Crash. It was somehow due to the Fed not doing enough monetary policy. What? I'm sorry. What, what are you talking about here? Oh no! I, uh, and you know, there's, I've been reading um, Shirakawa. Uh, the, the former governor of, of, of the Bank of Japan, uh, been reading his autobiography. I, I think he was a very good uh, central banker. Uh, well, he, he liked demographics for a start. And he describes how Bernanke, when he was still at Princeton, before he went on to the Fed, came over and lectured the Bank of Japan. You're not being aggressive enough. You shouldn't be doing this. You should be doing this yield curve control. You should be, you know, so on. And, and so Bernanke himself, of course, he's got the Nobel Prize, so he's got the, the ultimate the toy now. Um, but, but Bernanke fostered this idea that somehow central banks were the masters of the universe. Mm. And that's, the, that's your problem, because central bankers are not the masters of the universe. Nobody is. Not, you know. So, you know, if the chairman of the oil companies can't tell you what the oil price is going to be tomorrow, it's unlikely that the central bankers are going to be able to tell you what the economy is doing tomorrow. You know, it's just you know, there, there isn't a model that will tell you this. So the, the, the issue you've now got is 
while people believe that it's all about the Fed, well, then we're all happy because we know that when the Fed moves up rates, if it goes too far, the Fed, like a kind mother, will bring them down again and everything will be all right and we can go to sleep happily. But once it becomes apparent that the Fed can't do that anymore because of all these other circumstances, it's like a pantomime, you know? And, you know, we clap our hands and Ben Bernanke or Janet Yellen or uh, uh, Jay Powell appear and we all applaud, isn't this fantastic? But then we realise it's actually it was a pantomime. It wasn't real. And they, there's nothing, nothing they can do. Yeah. So it's very interesting that you say that because it brings up some very similar points. Uh, we had... Um, Ash Bennington sit down with Noriel Rabini recently and mm. he, the two of them spoke at length and Noriel really laid out what he sees as a host of dangerous problems, mm. uh, you know, happening at the same time that they've got to grapple with. Let's have, let's have a listen to that clip. But now this dilemma is becoming a trilemma because on one side we want to have price stability and inflation back to 2%. Two, we want to avoid a recession and a hard landing. And three, we want to avoid uh, financial instability. But as I describe in quite detail in my book, we live in a world in which uh, there are both supply and demand forces that are leading to high inflation and stagflation, inflation and recession. And we're also in a world in which there is so much private and public debt that the attempt of central banks to raise interest rates to fight inflation causes not only the risk of a hard landing, of the real economy, but it causes the risk of financial instability, debt ratios, private and public, that become excessive and unsustainable. And then if you're going to have financial instability, that's going to cause a credit crunch. It's going to make the recession more severe. And if the recession becomes more severe, debt ratios that are already high become more unsustainable as incomes and revenues fall. So we are entering a vicious cycle between high inflation, recession, and financial instability, feeding on each other. And that full interview is available on our platform. If you're not already an RV member, hit the QR code and you can join our learning tribe. Um, so, Paul, if we, we, have a, we have a great question from G. Blackburn. Is deposit flight enough to extend the crisis, or do we need CRE or other credit to weaken? Great question, Jay. Mm, thank you for that. Well, the, I, I think I'd, I'd answer it by saying up till now, we've been in a world where central banks, by and large, 20 years, have wanted to encourage animal spirits. And so they've deliberately taken interest rates as low as they can and pushed out liquidity in order to encourage people to chase yield. Mm. So what we've been doing up till now is all chasing yield, return, return. Now, now, so it's return on capital. You know, if I can only get 1% on, on treasuries and I can only get you know, 2% or something, I need to push the envelope. So my, my response to the question is this cycle will end when we go back to a world of worrying about return of capital. You know, I mean, it's, it's easy to laugh at the people who didn't read the fine print in the prospectus for Credit Suisse or the, the, fi you know, the fine print in uh, Silicon Valley Bank and so on. Of course, they were politically well connected, so they got away with it. But the, the ones in, uh, in Credit Suisse didn't. And, you know, they, you know, so, so somebody there has just lost, 60, I think it's 16 billion Swiss francs because they didn't read the small print. And so they're going to be next time, they're going to be a bit more worried about return of capital and a bit less worried about return on capital. Mm. And that's really how I see this going, that we've got an awful lot of stuff out there at the moment, which makes no sense. I mean, the last number I saw, you know, you've got 24 percent or something of companies in the US who don't make enough earnings to pay their interest bills which is kind of incredible. I mean, if you're a startup, well, of course, 
you know, you're being funded while you build out your product or your service or what market or whatever it is. Now, there's always going to be 10%, but more than double that, and we all know who they are, are they're companies that just never earn enough money, uh, but they can always refinance. And what those zombies do is they destroy the market for everybody else. Mm. Because, you know, if you're running a company and you don't have to pay, to pay pay the wages and so on out of earnings, you just go to your bankers and borrow some more. Well, I have to do the same. And, you know, if you look at what's happened in terms of behavior, which I think is really the, the nub of the question and why it's such a good question. If you look at behavior, what's happened is that people are no longer prudent in their lending. They're no longer prudent in running businesses. They're no longer prudent in running assets. Not everybody, but the, the, the zeitgeist is no longer prudent. Mm -hmm. It's about risk taking. And the problem is, if you've been prudent and you've, you know, you've done a good job and so on, your investors come to you as an asset manager and say, but that's all very well. But Paul over there, you know, you've got you've got a two percent Maggie. Paul over here has got 15. And you say, yes, but he'll lose it all for you. And they say, well, he hasn't lost it yet, has he? I think, you know, and, and so you're forced either to go out of business or to do the same madness as me. But yeah, that, that's really what worries me. That's a great point. It's not just, first of all, that was generationally, and that was considered the norm when you have zero interest rates for so long, you know? So it it it, it, it probably didn't seem as outlandish, uh, you know, a strategy, really. And so you've got a sort of generational rethink now, well, which I think, and I love the idea that you said it's not just the one person doing it. It becomes the norm for everyone because that's the competitive landscape. Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, you, you may have seen... One of my one of my longest uh, standing friends, Alan Budd, a wonderful economist, ended up uh, on the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, a chairman of the uh, Office of Budget, Budget Responsibility, all sorts of honours and so on. And I remember when I first knew him in the uh, in the late 70s, he was horrified, absolutely horrified that we had credit cards. <laughs> and he said, you must get rid of these immediately. And we said, but Alan, you know, interest rates are fifteen percent. You know, we, 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 you know, my, my wife and I were both earning, we're earning reasonable salaries for graduates, and so, but we just couldn't make, you know, make things ends meet. And he said, look, it's just like the nineteen twenties and the nineteen thirties. Everybody borrowed in the nineteen twenties, and the banks lent as much as they like, and then after the crash, they all wouldn't lend anymore, and everybody went bankrupt. And we are, you know, a lot of indicators are saying that the, 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 the only two parallels with today are 1929 and 2000. You know, the uh, CAPE, uh, 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 cyclically adjusted price earnings ratio, uh, you know, that, that, that is, those are the only two parallels here. So, and I, I, I genuinely think it's right. But, um, you know, Oof. so. Yep. Good thing uh, it's a I, it's good thing it's Friday and we're close to <laughs> we're close to the weekend, Paul. Because we meet. That's we why meet I got this class. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh boy. So let's let's so let's talk about let's talk about the economy. Um, and your thoughts on the economy because we had talked long ago and a lot of what you look at and, and your and your past um in the chemical industry and stuff you really look at very forward looking indicators. You're sort of the things that turn first. Um. Where are we with the U.S. economy? Because we had a, a S and P Global put a flash U.S. PMI out today, and it was 53. It surprised people. I'm um, higher than expected, and yet there seems to be this notion that we're headed for a recession, maybe a really a really severe one. What do you see happening? I see, from a strictly chemical industry point of view, we are at the worst point, probably in 50 years. Oof. I mean, it's just absolutely catastrophic really some of the um, some of the things that, that are happening you know we should be this is march if you if you look at the cycles uh seasonal cycles this should be the peak time of the year people have come out uh from christmas everybody destocks before christmas right so normally you get a bit of a rush as people restock then maybe it's winter maybe it's not and then now they're out there because the weather is getting better Easter is coming up, and that period between Easter and uh, and, and and June, and Memorial you know, in the States, 
um, it, you know, it's, it's absolutely peak time. So everybody ought to be stocking, and they're not. Stocks are, are, are low. Um, you know, you've got containers empty all around the world. Uh, nothing is happening. What is confusing everybody is that you've still got this residual money over from the stimulus. And so individuals, they've got, you know, one example of that is they've still got lots of people have got mortgages, you know, at 2% or 3% or whatever. They haven't adjusted to today's levels. And, you know, they're going to do their best not to do it. So people themselves are still living in a world of a year or so ago. They got good savings, so they got furlough payments and so on. So, and of course, naturally enough, they're keen to catch up on two years of being locked down and everything else. So I, I think one has to always, with, with statistics, to, to sort of read into them what they're trying to tell you, rather than just take a face value. So I'm not surprised that the services sector is doing very well. I'm not surprised either. Well, actually, I am surprised that the, 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 the durable goods, the manufacturing sector, is doing quite so badly. And, you know, we saw as we got to the end of COVID and zero COVID in China, you know, all the investment banks were busy telling us, oh, there's going to be this fantastic boom in China. Well, hello. Yeah. No boom going on. Mm -hmm. I th you bring up a great point, and this is why I think it's so fascinating every time we talk, because there's a lag, right? And so mm -hmm. there are leading things that are telling you that things are way worse underneath mm -hmm. the covers than they appear to be. But you've got that sort of, yeah. you know, the, the people. But, I mean, typically what happens at this time is that un you know, unemployment is, or employment is always a, a lagging indicator. Mm -hmm. um, and it's particularly a lagging indicator today for very reasonable reasons. Uh, one, you know, you you had difficulty getting hold of staff during COVID because everybody was ill and so on. Then things came back and everybody job hopped and so on. So now you, you really want to retain staff. And also in certain areas, for example, you've got the Inflation Reduction Act, which is going to cause a great amount of spending. So if you're in construction, you know, construction employment is quite, quite good here. Well, it almost ought to be because... If you've been short of construction workers, but you know there's a lot of money coming in, well, you'll hang on to them. And so you, what I'm saying is you're getting a lot of side currents here. It's part of what I was saying earlier. It's not quite price discovery as such, but it's trying to look at these trends beneath the headlines and say, OK, I'm, I'm sure the number is right. What's it trying to tell me here? Yeah. What about inflation? What are you looking at in terms of prices? Well, the end point of where we get to, because of demographics and globally aging populations, is deflation. But we do have this, you know, thing called the Ukraine uh, invasion, and uh, and that the one thing that Ukraine really disrupted, and that we've been following, as you know, very closely since March or April last year. Uh, is what's happening to food prices, because uh, you know we all have to eat. Essentially, what happened was that Russia cut well, that Europe decided to cut off Russian gas supplies. Now that's all fine; we can all agree with that. But what ga natural gas goes into ammonia, which goes to fertilizer, and so what happened was that fertilizer availability collapsed. 70%, 70% of European fertilizer production was shut down for most of last year. And when it, you know, what was available, of course, the prices were very much higher because there was a shortage. It wasn't so much true in, in the States as such. It wasn't so it's true. You know, you know, markets, to some extent, are, don't arbitrage, but they're, they're regional. But what you then find, of course, is that fertilizer doesn't have an effect in the, t the year that you're eating the food. It happens because you know, all the food that we ate last year, more or less, was grown with fertilizer from the year before. So what we're now seeing is farmers unable to find fertilizer or still unable to afford fertilizer for this year's crops. And so we're seeing shortages. 
and you know we're seeing shortages of all sorts of things and it's going to get worse and so when i know, when i look at inflation what i can see is that yes i'm sure house prices will come down a long way i mean they went up a long way they, they will come down that's what happens uh, oil prices have come down you know quite a bit probably got further to come natural gas prices have come down a lot but not in europe particularly i mean they've come down a lot but they're still four or five times higher than they were so you've got this ongoing problem in an absolutely critical area and if you look at i mean you can look at the uk uh la, 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 yesterday uh food, you know inflation went up and it was mainly because of food prices and if you look that's, at food prices in the that's States. That's very interesting. Yeah, that's that's really interesting because that's the big dilemma that the central bank has, right? They're trying mm. to deal with financial stability. Um, and you can argue around a lot of other parts of the inflation picture, and people do disagree on that. And, of course, we know wages lag. Um, mm. And for an in-depth on this, uh, Raul and Julian did a, did a deep dive into their whole global macro outlook. Mm. Um, it's on the platform uh, for those who are interested, um, but it's it, this food situation is different, and that's an essential that's going to hit everyone. So that that's really problematic. We've got a bunch of questions. I want to get to them, but I just 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 want to uh, respond to something um, in the chat, and that's people asking about this emergency meeting or secret meeting, rather that Janet Yellen has called. Um, there was some reporting on that today. Listen, if if they you know, I, I'm not going to ask you to comment on it, Paul. I would just say that if they are not, if the Treasury is not talking to regulators on a Friday heading into the weekend, given what we see happening in banking, the, I would be more concerned if they're not meeting as opposed to the fact they're meeting. I know oh, everyone's jumping all over and on Twitter as sign that there this is a sign of impending doom. The very serious things happening. I should hope they spend the entire weekend meeting. That's well, just my opinion. All right, let's, let's I, dive I, in here. I, I, I just add one thing. Yes. Which reminds me, now, if if you if everybody ought to read Galbraith's The Great Crash, because it's so relevant to what's going on. And one of the things that Galbraith points out is that during the crash, you get what, what he calls the meetings of the great men, because they were all men in 1929. And, uh, and, and everybody, first of all, would panic. And then they'd say, ah, the great men, the head of that. Man. So they'll sort it out. And so markets would rally again. But of course, the forces were far beyond the, you know, the, the great men or whatever. And I, I, you know, I mean, if you look at what happened this week uh, with Janet Yellen and Jay Powell, you know, Powell is busy talking the market up. Oh, yes, everything's fine. Yes, I'm going to reduce interest rates very quickly, really. No, I'm not telling you that, but wink, wink, you know where I'm going. Uh, I didn't get my 50 million by pushing up interest rates. Don't worry. And then Janet Yellen, who obviously, I mean, they obviously hasn't talked. Says, "Oh no, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, de secure deposits, insured deposits at all." And the market goes up 150 points or whatever it was, and it plummets 500. Mm. Now, if they can't even get to align their statements while they're both publicly talking, well, I really don't think there's much hope for us. Mm. <laughs> So a uh, question um, from Trillion X, uh, I agree, Paul, return of capital should be the concern of investors here as cre credit crisis is starting soon. What do you think would be the whale? The, the way out? The whale, like the big, the big, you know, the big failure that sparks you know, a, a really oh. serious acceleration of this, I think, is oh, yeah. what oh, it's uh, yeah. getting to. Uh, okay. We know Deutsche Bank's default, uh, credit default swaps were widening. It came back a little bit as the day went on. But, you know, I assume there are conversations going on globally. Andreas tweeted out something fantastic earlier today. If you didn't check out, see his Twitter about some bank hitting up the lines to the max they could. It was not who were not outside of the you know the Fed swap lines. There's a lot going on that that's very serious. Yeah. But, but what I, do you think I mean, would be think, the thing to tip it into a, a different level here, Paul? Well, it, it's not going to be the states, and it's not going to be Europe, in our view. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I mean, all these things that are happening are well, have been known for a while. We've all known that Credit Suisse was going to go bankrupt at some time. We've all known the Deutsche Bank. Yeah, you know, that they've been we, struggling, we, right? You know, I mean, I, I even, you know, back in August, for goodness sake, I even had a, the main letter in the Financial Times saying, guys, we're going to have this major financial shock. 
you know, but just in front, they printed it in their lead letter just ahead of, 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 of Jackson Hole. Yeah, so if, if I can work this out, most people can work this out. This is, no, but this is not, this is not where the big issue is. What, you, you have to ask yourself, where has the most extreme lending fiasco been? And the answer is in Asia. It's been in Japan and it's been in China. Yeah. Well, I wanted to I want to pick that up on, uh, uh, in just a moment, but I want to squeeze a couple more questions about this what? because I put it up. What's your outlook? Bob's asking, what's your outlook on gold? Max also asking, wondering if Paul uh, can talk about gold miners. Is it time to get short? Thoughts on gold and well, miners. God, the the issue with gold is whether you think that there'll be a, f a flight to quality. And if you think there's going to be a flight to quality, will it be gold or will it not be? Mm -hmm. uh, Mark Farber, who you know, uh, you know, I admire greatly. Mark has always had the view that what you need to do is to own gold, actual gold, not gold stocks, because he said when the last ship leaves the harbour, if you walk along with your gold ingot, the captain will give you a place on the ship. And that, to me, sums up the case for gold. The, the problem is that as you're walking along with your gold bar, I'm worried that somebody like you know, young like Brian will just biff me on the head and take the gold bar. So you know, all my careful work is, is gone. Um, so and that sums up my attitude to gold. Um, I can't actually eat gold. Mm -hmm. you know, I can't heat my home with gold. I can't drive the car with gold. So, so I have to be in a certain state of believing that actually society will continue, and I don't need to have something that I can use. But actually, it's you know, gold is security. So uh, it's you know, I, I'm not I'm not going to answer Bob Bob and Mark Max's question because I I simply don't know at the moment. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, there's it's, too too many variables. The, and that's and that's we've heard that so much. It's it's such a it's such a difficult time to be looking far out at all to make it mm. because there there are so many unknowns. Um, I just want to remind everybody uh, who are, who are asking all these fantastic questions. Next Thursday the thirtieth and Friday the thirty first, Real Vision's Festival of Learning is returning. And because of everything that's going on, and because of all these really really critical questions we all have, um, we are making it free. You had to pay to go before, but this time it's going to be free. You just need to go to realvision.com forward slash festival. 2023-2023 to save your seat. You know, as Raul always says, this is why Real Vision was um, created in the first place to democratize information, to try to arm everybody with as much as they can. And so we're going to be doing things like uh, talking about personal finance. I'm doing a session with Jared. We're going to be grading portfolio, the portfolio, uh, portfolio doctors, Mish, who you know is commodity maven, Brent Donnelly, master at Forex. We're going to have Dave, who's technical, Dave Floyd, um, all sorts of stuff like that. And also the psychology. What do you need to be thinking about in this really stressful, uncertain time, uh, you know, to sort of set yourself and your framework and sort of not fall victim to a lot of the um, the stress of the situation is what I'd say. So Denise Shaw, who's amazing, is going to be with us too. And that's just a little, those are just the ones I'm doing. There's a whole bunch more coming. So I think it's a really important time. So go ahead and reserve your seat. We're at the half hour mark, which means that Real Vision members are going to stay with us. If you want to continue on the conversation with us, hit that code, jump on that free trial and join us. Um, if not, have a fantastic weekend. I have a feeling we're all going to be glued to our screens um, and our devices for the news that's going to break. Um, but, but we'll be right here back with you on Monday. Um, for all the info you need. So, but we hope you join us.